All right, cool. Um, so yeah, this is my first lecture with you guys, so I'm excited to be giving this to you. Uh, here's what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to preview Ethereum. Uh, I'm not going to go too in depth. I'm going to show you the limitations that Bitcoin has, which led to uh, Ethereum. And then I'm going to talk about uh, Ethereum on a much deeper scale. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about smart contracts. So you've probably heard all these words for Ethereum. Blockchain, trustless, decentralized applications, smart contracts, DAOs, Bitcoin 2.0. These are all kind of true. Um, but Ethereum is more than that. It encompasses all these things into one thing. And the way we can define it formally is it's a decentralized platform designed to run smart contracts. It's resistant to censorship. And it's basically like a distributed server if you can think of it kind of like Git, uh, except people are running computations in the background to serve up other people's transactions on this uh, decentralized computer. We'll talk a little bit more about how that works. Ethereum has an asset called Ether, which I'm guessing many of you have heard of. And the price is kind of like skyrocketed. Uh, but basically, the whole point of Ether is not to be money. The whole point is actually to power this system. Uh, and in order to have the system that's decentralized, you need to make sure everybody's incentives are aligned. This system is actually account-based and not UTXO-based. And we'll dive a little bit more deeper into what that really means. Um, but one thing to remember about a UTXO from last lecture is that it's not a transaction, but UTXOs are inputs and outputs of transactions. So what is basically the blockchain for Ethereum. It's basically a transaction state machine, uh, which shared state. It's cryptographically secure. Um, it's secured by similar algorithms to Bitcoin. Uh, it uses the same digital signatures and uh, very similar hash functions to Bitcoin. Um, and it's basically open to everybody. You know, you can see uh, what happens in public on these blockchains. And anybody can run like a client that serves uh, the whole ecosystem. And you can make money, too, if you become a miner. You guys have probably heard of what a state machine is, um, if you're like CS majors. How many of you are like CS or East majors? OK, majority of you. Um, I'll kind of just review what it is uh, on a basic level. But all it is is you, know, you have a series of inputs. Uh, you put that in some kind of state transition function. That function then outputs a new state. Um, and yeah, that's literally it. It's literally just a function that you can go back in time and see the inputs. But you can also go forward in time by using new, new inputs. And Ethereum is basically just this, um, if you think on it at a very fundamental scale. Uh, now, obviously, things in the real world are not this simple. Uh, they're way more complicated uh, because you know there's, there's, there's all kinds of uh, attack vectors. There's all kinds of flaws that could potentially happen. But before I talk more about Ethereum, I want to talk more about Bitcoin and why you should look into Ethereum and why Ethereum came about. So how does Bitcoin work? So Nick kind of talked about the theory last lecture about how Bitcoin kind of uh, you know, works. But you know, it needs people to run clients that basically run all the functionalities that Nick talked about. And Bitcoin, like Ethereum, also has state transitions. You can model. I mean, you can model almost anything as a state transition machine. But if you look at Bitcoin and Ethereum from this standpoint, you'll see that it's actually quite simple. So uh, the state in Bitcoin is basically going to be the ownership status of all existing Bitcoins. The state transition function is going to take a state and a transaction, and it's going to output a new result. So we have this function called apply. And it takes a state, and it takes uh, a list of transactions. And basically, it outputs a new state from that. So let's walk through this pseudocode. Uh, you can think of this as like a blockchain update algorithm at its most fundamental core. So for every input in this transaction, uh, we're going to look at the UTXOs and the signatures. And if it's not in the current state um, that's like listed remotely on, other, on like the main chain, then it's invalid, so you return an error. Uh, if the input signature does not equal the, lo the lookup of the UTXO signature, then you return an error as well. 
and also, another important thing is that the sum of the input utxos ah cannot be less than the sum of output utxos. you know that money can't just go like disappear, right? it just can't disappear. it has to it has to match up. so if that happens, it's obviously invalid. and once you do all once ah once you check all these like basically assert statements, um you basically update the state ah by removing all the input utxos and adding all the output utxos to the new state. does that kind of make sense? So how does the block validation uh, algorithm work if you look at it from a state transition standpoint? So you know you look at the previous algorithm and it works really well for a centralized currency system, but if you want to make a decentralized currency system, you need consensus. You need uh, you need some kind of state transition system that you can kind of look back in time and make sure that you have all the data for. So in Bitcoin, uh, we produce these packages of transactions called blocks. And the way we validate them is as such. So let's jump into the validate block function. Uh, it takes an input as a block. Uh, you need to check if the previous block has been validated. Uh, as we remember from like the proof of work al algorithm uh, from last lecture, you can you can check it using that. Uh, then you want to make sure that the current block timestamp is greater than the previous block timestamp, obviously. Uh, but then you also want to make sure that it's not 120 minutes into the future, because uh, that would be that would make uh, conditions for an invalid block. Uh, you also want to check the proof of work for the current block. You want to make sure that uh, people have agreed that this is this block is is a valid block. You also want to get the transaction list of the previous block, um, and you basically want to scan through this list, and you want to make state transitions uh, for the next block. So as you see here, we're just updating the state of the. I'll let that move out of the way. But basically, we're just updating the state of the current block to based on the previous block using the apply function, and we return true if it uh, if it ends up working out well for us. So Bitcoin's perspective on these applications that you may have heard about on Ethereum, uh, you know, there's Namecoin, which is probably like the biggest and most successful like Bitcoin project. Um, basically, it's decentralized name registration. How many of you are familiar with how like name registration kind of works, with like domain names and like uh, top level domains? Okay, some of you. Okay, um, I won't cover it too much, but basically, like whenever you want to get like a domain name for, say, I don't know, uh, Bitcoin.com, you have to go to a name registrar, and you have to go register that name uh, with them. And it's all very centralized because these businesses basically have access to sell these domains, but you can't just go directly through to uh, the main provider, which is, I believe, ICANN, uh, to like get your domain. You have to go through these middlemen in order to get your domain name. Now, what Namecoin does is, okay, it has to work with ICANN because in order to make these uh, domain names useful, it has to work with the existing inf internet infrastructure. But you know, it sells these domain names in a very different way. It uses Bitcoin in order to uh, secure these domain names. Uh, so the idea is you have a first-to-file paradigm, and the first, basically how it works is somebody just registers the name first, and the second fails. And this is very easy to verify using Bitcoin consensus, but it's not that easy to write in Bitcoin script. So that's why this application isn't that great, but it's still very like successful for Bitcoin. There's also some other applications that we can talk about. Uh, colored coins. This allows people to create their own currencies. How many of you have like heard of the I like seen all the ICOs that have come out? Maybe some of you have bought. How many of you have like bought all coins and other other Ethereum tokens? Cool. Yeah. So colored coins are kind of the, I guess, predecessor to all these like new tokens that are built on top of Ethereum. Uh, basically, the way it works, you issue a new currency by publicly assigning color to like a UTXO. So you're using existing transaction data uh, to basically just uh, define this as a different colored coin. Um, I won't go too into depth on how that works, but remember, I think Nick told you that uh, transactions in bitcoins are essentially scripts. You can include extra data in them such that uh, you can you can like create another layer on top of it essentially. And by creating that other layer on top, you can change the way the coins work. You can use Bitcoin's consensus underlying consensus system in order to uh, create your own token 
and you don't have to like create your own network infrastructure to do it either. So it's a very like hacky way of creating a coin. And this kind of like goes on to like meta coins, which are also kind of a kind of a not a big thing on Bitcoin, but a very small niche side of Bitcoin because these are very like difficult to make and there's very niche use cases for these. But yeah, basically for a meta coin, you just provide an alternative state transition function and you let Bitcoin just handle all of the mining and networking infrastructure. So it's like very it seems very simple, but when you start actually programming a MetaCoin on Bitcoin, it's actually pretty messy. So what are some limitations of Bitcoin script that kind of lead to this messiness, right? Uh, so there's a lack of Turing completeness. Uh, so how many of you are familiar with what Turing completeness is? OK. Uh, basically, it doesn't, basically, in this case, um, you know, Bitcoin, does not, Bitcoin, Bitcoin script does not support loops. Um, why might that be a good thing? Any any ideas why? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So in a distributed system, um, especially one that's like very decentralized, you want to make sure that uh, people aren't able to you know DDoS your network. And one of the ways to prevent that is to remove the loop functionality. Um, now there is a way for people to still DDoS your network, but it requires writing a lot a lot of code that does the equivalent of a loop. But it's not as easy. Value blindness. Uh, that's another limitation. Basically, there's no way for a UTXO script to have any fine-grained control over the amount withdrawn. Um, so for like very simple applications, uh, like just withdrawing like smaller amounts of Bitcoin, uh, like and over like a small period of time and scripting that, that is actually like pretty tricky to do um, because UTXOs are like all or nothing, and it's pretty expensive to have like varying denominations of those UTXOs because you have to keep generating new and new ones as you like slowly divide them up. Uh, Bitcoin script also has a lack of state. So there's no there's only like unspent and spent UTXOs. And it, it's it's completely binary, so you can't have like any efficient form of withdrawal limits that you might have on Ethereum. So there's no like in betweens. <coughs> Blockchain blindness. So you can't look into like the data. Uh, for like uh, the on-chain data uh, that comes with all the blocks on the blockchain. So for example, the nonce, the timestamp, the previous block hashes, those are all very good sources of randomness and they allow for other applications on Ethereum to work quite well, such as gambling, casinos, um, other things that might need randomness. Let's talk about Ethereum on a more deeper level though. So we've seen this, we've seen this, we've seen this. Um, Let's kind of put these side by side and take a look. Uh, Ethereum, Turing complete. Bitcoin, not Turing complete. Much more simpler currency. Uh, Ethereum is account based. Bitcoin is UTXO based. Uh, basically, the currency itself for Bitcoin is the main goal, whereas Ethereum, uh, it's all about uh, supporting the computational network infrastructure. And Ethereum's block time is actually much faster, meaning that when you send transactions, you'll be able to confirm them way faster. So 12 seconds versus 10 minutes. Um, that's pretty significant difference. Let's talk about accounts. So a Bitcoin ba user's balance is going to be the sum of UTXOs, which they own the private keys to. So you see below where Bob owns the private keys to the set of UTXOs. Uh, you know, it's just a bunch of different uh, transaction, unspent transaction outputs from previous transactions that have happened on chain. Uh, it's a little weird to think about at first, but uh, if you actually go through Block Explorer and like start to click through things, it starts to make a little more sense how money starts to get divided up. Uh, Ethereum, on the other hand, uses accounts, which pretty much already keeps track of the balance. There's a field literally for balance. So no need to worry about dealing with all these complicated mess of UTXOs. So the global shared state is comprised of all these small objects, and they're able to send uh, messages to each other. These are called accounts. An account has a 20-byte identifier, and it looks a little like this with a 0x in front because it's in hexadecimal. Uh, there's two types. You have externally owned, which are basically stuff that you have on Coinbase or uh, the accounts that you personally use for your own use. Uh, you have control over the private keys. And there's no code associated with them. 
whereas there's also contract accounts and these have code uh, and these are where smart contracts are deployed to. So what's stored in the account state? So you have the knots, which is the number of transactions that we send from an external account. Uh, if it's a contract account, it's the number of contracts created. We have the balance, that's the amount of way owned by the address. We'll talk more about the denominations, but for now, 1 to the 18th way equals 1 ether. So it's like a lot less than 1 ether to like do transactions. We have the storage root. And this is the hash of the root node of a Merkle Patricia, tr Merkle Patricia try. That's a typo. But basically, uh, we're going to be talking more about Merkle Patricia tries in the protocol chapter, not here. Um, as you saw with Bitcoin, it had a Merkle Patricia tree. There's reasons for why the states are different. And we're going to have a code hash. This is the hash of the Ethereum virtual machine, which we will also talk more about in protocol. Um, this is going to be the hash of the code, the EVM code that is for the contract. Um, and if it's an external account, it's just going to be the hash of like an empty string. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, on the last slide, it said something like the nonce is the number of contracts created if it's a contract account. Yeah. Does that mean like a contract account can have multiple contracts associated with it? Hmm. Good question. Uh, I, I believe not. Not per, not on a per address basis. Um, you can, you can have multiple. You can basically import contracts, and I think that's also what it might be denominating. Um, like the number of contracts that you, as a external account owner, have created. Uh, Nick, do you know if like when you import a co import a contract, when you deploy two contracts and you like import one? Does it deploy to the same address, and then you can like select which one? Uh, you say that again. So you have two contracts. Yeah, you have two contracts. You deploy, <laughs> you deploy, uh, you deploy them to the same address. Suppose you can do that. Uh, is that like possible? Because like you can import contracts, and you can technically deploy two contracts, but I'm not sure if you would deploy them at the same address. Yeah, you can. That's what, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, you can't deploy them at the same address. So I'm not exactly sure why uh, this number is there, but it's there. Uh, yeah. So we have externally owned versus contract accounts. Um, this diagram is really simplifies the equation. Last semester is pretty messy. So, um, so basically, any transaction that occurs on the blockchain, it's always going to be set in motion by transactions fired by people by externally owned accounts. So you can see in the top diagram, uh, we start with an externally owned account sending a transaction to a contract account. And then there's an internal transaction which goes into uh, a contract account. Uh, maybe it was like a function call that was triggered, which sends information to another contract. Um, we'll kind of talk more in depth about the mechanics of this later. But uh, this is kind of the idea between uh, how externally owned contracts and contract accounts differ. Uh, with externally owned accounts, you only send transactions between them. There's no such thing as like an internal transaction between two externally owned accounts. So remember that all accounts is basically the network state. Uh, you know, if you look at the current balance, you look at the storage state, the contract code. Um, the entire Ethereum network has to agree on that in order that for there to be like a valid uh, state. So the Ethereum network state ends up being updated with every block. As we discussed, it's kind of like a state transition machine. Uh, and accounts basically interact with other accounts, other contracts, and contract state through transactions, which then modify this account state. So that should kind of give you a global overview of what we're looking at. So why use accounts? You know, Why not use UTXOs? So there's a lot of space savings by using accounts. Uh, you know, nodes only need to update the account balance rather than having to store all the UTXOs, right? So instead of having floating UTXOs everywhere and having to keep on generating new ones and store that on the whole blockchain, you simply just update the balance and you keep track of that old balance on the blockchain. This is much more intuitive, meaning that, you know, when you go to program this, uh, instead of having to bundle together all the UTXOs like we did with 
our previous pseudocode, uh, you simply just query the balance of the user. It's that simple. Uh, and there's comparable efficiency due to Merkleization. What that means is um, because of the use of Merkle Patricia tries, we can run SPV light clients, meaning that you don't have to download the whole blockchain to set up a, set up a light node to like send Ether. Let's talk about fees, because fees are a pretty important part of how this whole ecosystem runs. So every computation that occurs as a result of a transaction on the Ethereum network incurs some kind of a fee. And that fee is known as gas. So gas is used to measure the fees for a particular computation. And gas price is another variable, which is the amount of Ether you're willing to spend on every unit of gas. This is measured in G-way, uh, which is 1 to the 18th way. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's not 1 to the 18th way. 1 to the 18th way is 1 Ether, and 1 G-way is about uh, 1 billion way. That's actually not that much. It's very small. Um, with every transaction, a sender gets to set the gas limit and a gas price. So this is important because you know when you send transactions, uh, when you start writing your smart contracts in Truffle, you're going to have these variables uh, available to you to like modify. Um, also in Remix, you can change these variables as well. But basically, the gas price times the gas limit is the max amount of way that you are going to be willing to pay for that transaction. And this is an important reason uh, because uh, you know you need to send enough gas in order for things to execute. And we'll talk about what happens. Why? What? If uh, you don't set enough, yeah. Why don't we just set it for the max way? Why do you have to set a rate time? What do you mean? Like, why is Ethereum made that way? Yeah, why do you have the gas price times amount of gas versus just setting the max way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the reason why, I think it has to do with this decentralized system. Uh, where people have to kind of agree on things. And not all miners just agree on like a price. So there's variable prices between like miners in the network. And because of this, there's kind of like an exchange rate. So if you plot a chart, it like changes. Um, so yeah, it's like there's just, like variable price between like different people like running uh, nodes on the network. That's why there's these numbers. And that's why you kind of have to like select them appropriately. Yeah. Ah, for internal transactions, who sets the gas price? Um, so it's based on the parent transaction. We'll kind of talk about that later. Um, there's no way to like set the gas price on an internal transaction if you think about it. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, is there a gas limit imposed by the Ethereum network that it's like the maximum you can set per transaction? I believe there is um, maximum per transaction. Uh, that would probably be the block gas limit because you can you can basically only put a limited amount of gas inside each block in Ethereum, and that limit is kind of agreed on based on what people set when they run Geth or like some other client. Um, so yeah, that would be the limit. I don't know what the limit is now, but I believe it was like near a hundred thousand or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so let's walk through an example. So I have a gas limit of 50,000. Uh, remember, this is just like gas units. This is no like uh, denominated units. It's just gas, right? Uh, gas price, which is 20 G-way. Uh, so using the max transaction fee formula, uh, 50,000 times 20 G-way is this much, uh, this much in terms of weight. Uh, which is basically this much ether, which is not much at all. Um, ether is like what at like a thousand somewhere somewhere around there. So this is like le this is like pennies. Um, yeah. So since the gas limit is the maximum gas the sender is willing to spend money on, uh, if they have enough ether 
in their account balance to cover this maximum and the gas limit is enough to execute the transaction, uh, the transaction will therefore execute. So you need, you just need enough, uh, you need enough gas to basically execute transactions. And unused gas is going to be refunded <coughs> to the sender in any case. Yeah. How do you know if your gas limit is enough to execute a transaction? Yeah, there, so there's like a, there's a few ways to know that. Um, there are calculators out there that you can use that like kind of tell you. Basically, uh, the Ethereum yellow paper defines like a bunch of equations for each EVM operation, uh, which is what the high level language like compiles down to. And each of those operations has a cost. So, if you do some multiplication and you like calculate all the operations you do, you can get an idea of how much gas you're going to use. But basically, the most people send more than they usually need to, and the miners will usually take more than they need to. Um, you've maybe heard of like crypto kitties, like people will like use a lot of gas, will need to use a lot of gas in order to uh, get miners to accept their transactions because crypto kitties is uh, starting to like eat up the network bandwidth so they have to people have to like compete to like get their transaction on the chain yeah also an interesting note uh, there's all these names for uh, gas limit start gas gas limit gas used uh, you'll see this when you like write write in truffle or like use get um, yeah just acknowledge they're all the same so what if there's not enough gas to execute the transaction what happens the transaction runs out of gas. It's considered invalid. The state changes on uh, for that block that you were trying to get uh, is going to be reversed. And the failing transaction is going to be recorded. You can actually like look up your transaction if it failed on Etherscan. Uh, and that's because uh, the gas won't be refunded. And people already put work into uh, like your transaction. So there's a diagram here, actually. Um, you have a sender with like 250. Uh, he starts a transaction. He uses gas, uses gas, uses gas. Runs out of gas. Has to revert the state. It doesn't even get to the receiver at all. And that person ends up with less money. So where does the fee go? The fee goes to miners. Why? It's because they expand all the effort to keep the network alive. And it's their reward. It's their incentive. So the higher the gas price the sender is willing to pay, the greater the value the miner, greater value the miner derives from this. Uh, and they're less likely to ignore it. So they're going to put it there, you know, if you spend more money on your transaction fees, your miner will be more enticed to like put your transaction first. So you could get confirmed faster. Um, if you want to get an ICO, you know, some people will put like twenty twenty thousand dollars worth of gas, but then they'll buy like, I don't know, like uh, $500,000 worth of coins and then they'll be like oh yeah that's like a manageable cost because you know they, they got all the tokens and people are upset that they don't have tokens so there's reasons why like people will just throw in money at this and gas prices will fluctuate like crazy um, it's because everybody has like different incentives in this network do you have a question? yeah so Bitcoin doesn't have uh, a Oh, do all miners get paid the, the same? The right, right, right. So uh, for Bitcoin, miners also get paid with transaction fees. But there's also the Coinbase reward from finding a block. And you'll often find people get in pools in order to like find this block together. And depending on how much computational power they give to this pool, they'll get paid out from the Coinbase reward, but also uh, all the transaction fees that go to the miner. And it's kind of distributed amongst miners. Yeah. Uh, how would people determine if the set that your gas limit? I thought that every single when you send something, I, I, everything has a fixed payment, kind of like uh, every like transaction. Uh, each like line of execution in the transaction has a fixed gas cost. So yeah. Why would you have to set a limit? Right. So the limit is actually just like what the maximum you're willing to spend because it's always because this price always varies. It's kind of a user experience thing almost, if you think about it. So like, 
Um, the reason why I might set my gas limit a little more generously than like the exact amount is because, oh, miners might change their mind. Uh, Ethereum gave freedom for like miners in this network to like adjust the price of like how much things cost. Yeah. Yeah. Is the mempool structure for Ethereum and Bitcoin the same way? Um, in what sense, I guess? Because I guess they're different platforms, so they'd automatically be different because they'd they'd, they'd automatically have to function different <coughs> differently. But peop but I guess if you're wondering how people would get like paid out in that mempool, then yeah, people get paid out in, in the similar way. Yeah. Uh, could you repeat the first part? Uh, do they store any other details than the pending transactions and maybe the uh, gas price or the equivalent of Bitcoin? Gas price. I don't. I don't quite understand your question. Price. Or you can come to me afterwards. I'll. I'll answer. Um, okay. Where's um, Vigo? All right. Yeah. So let's talk about storage fees. Uh, Ethereum is not just for computation, it also can be used for storage. So uh, the gas you use to pay for storage, it's proportional to the smallest multiple of 32 bytes you use. It's kind of just like you round uh, to like the storage you use, and you pay for that much. <laughs> so increased storage will, however, increase the size of the Ethereum state on all nodes. And there's incentives to keep this small because a bigger blockchain means less accessibility for full nodes to come on the network, meaning more centralization. And the Ethereum network, when they built this, clearly didn't want it uh, because there's a side reason, and it's because they made this, uh, they made this whole uh, idea of mining ASIC resistant. Uh, whereas Bitcoin is not ASIC resistant, and very few people can produce specific chips for just mining. Uh, so Ethereum has taken a more different philosophy and said, okay, we want to prevent complete centralization of mining pools. Let's basically optimize our mining algorithm for GPU pools. We'll kind of talk about that in protocol. So if a transaction has a step that clears an entry in storage, the fee is going to be waived for that and a refund is given for that storage space, actually, which is kind of weird if you think about it. Why do we need fees? Every single operation is executed by the network, uh, and it's executed simultaneously. So every full node is affected. So you can think of Ethereum as a very redundantly parallel computer, not an efficient one. You can imagine that you might think that, oh, Ethereum is wasting a lot of computational power, right? You know, aren't they just like computing the same thing over and over again? Yeah, but it's also for security reasons. Uh, the more people that, you know, compute the same trans the compute the same stuff and agree on it, the more secure the network gets. So it's like a trade-off you have to make. And that's often a trade-off you have to make with blockchains in general. So why else do we need fees? Uh, computational steps on the EVM become very expensive when you think about uh, Ethereum doing this, these operations redundantly, right? Again, a lot of wasted computation. Smart contracts are therefore best used for simple tasks. So you shouldn't be doing machine learning on them. You shouldn't be doing file storage on them. Uh, it's best if you just do verifying signatures, uh, you do some cryptographic stuff on them, or you put some business logic on there. But you know, doing, doing machine learning and file storage, Ethereum's not quite ready for that yet. Not until we get like very parallelized, uh, distributed computational systems that run on cryptocurrency. Yeah. This is kind of about the uh, last slide still, but um, when a new block is found, do all the other nodes have to read through the logic to confirm that the state's valid, right? Because when a new block is found. So I guess when a new block is found, um, it's already so the proof of work algorithm when you're finding a new block, that's actually people running the computation, if that makes sense. So you don't really run the computation until, so you so you run the computation until the block is found essentially, but it's only like one step per node, if that makes sense, and then the rest of it is dedicated to like the 
the rest of the mining algorithm. We'll kind of talk about that in protocol. It's kind of out of scope. But you can talk to me afterwards, and I can what tell you in depth. Miners have like different transactions that they pay to improve their blockchain. Miners have different transactions they pay. So I mean, miners can have miners can have like different order of transactions. But as long as they find a valid block and they publicize it first, and people like you know people then agree on it, then they win, right? Yeah. Uh, so if there's another smart contract that provides the storage and has like such, you kind of push that. So like you deploy it and push the fees on to people who use the smart contract. Is that how it works? So like as a developer, you don't have to worry about paying for the storage. So whoever uses the smart contract then pays for the storage fees or the construction fees mm. for such a customer. Yeah. So when you yeah when you run the smart contract, basically anybody who like posts a contract and leverages like an instance of that contract, um, they have to worry about like the fees, computational fees, storage fees. But that's pushed on to like users. Yeah, that's pushed on to users, correct. Um, but you can also abstract it away and like uh, do some techniques such that the developer handles like those things. Um, yeah. So well, why else do we need fees? Uh, Turing completeness, uh, so the halting problem uh, basically is the inability to determine when a loop will terminate. Uh, meaning that <coughs> if you cannot determine this, you can't detect infinite loops, and therefore you can't stop people from DDoSing the network. But if you have fees, if people are paying for that, then it's kind of okay for them to you know, DDoS the network, and you can increase fees as, as it gets worse and worse, and to a point where it gets unsustainable. Um, the network will only be disturbed for a little bit of time, but not for a long time. Now obviously this is a detriment to users in general, and this shouldn't happen. But yeah, it's, it's certainly possible for someone to just pay their way. So this is a sign in URL. Uh, code is fees. Tiny URL developers too. Let's talk about transactions and messages. So what is a transaction? You can think of these fundamentally as things that just change state. Uh, but a formal definition, you should think of a transaction as a cryptographically signed piece of instruction generated by an externally owned account, serialized, and then submitted to a blockchain. Does anybody not know what serialized means? Or does someone want to explain what serialized means? You wanna? Does it mean, uh, doesn't mean using a hash function. Could try though. Yeah. Yeah, basically, um, that's like the most fundamental way of thinking about it. Uh, in most cases, like you'll turn it into some kind of JSON or some kind of encoded format that's very easy to send and then read after it's sent. Um, yeah. So the important thing with transactions is that there's two types. We have message calls and we have contract creation transactions. But before I go into those, I want to tell you a little bit more about what's inside a transaction on the programmatic level. You have the nonce, which is the number of transactions that is sent by the sender. You have the gas price, that's the amount of way the sender is willing to pay per unit of gas to execute the transaction. You have the gas limit, that's the max amount of gas the sender is willing to pay for executing this transaction, and this is set before any computation is done. You have two, which is the address of the recipient. This can be, uh, this can be like an externally owned contract or a contract address. You have a value, uh, this is the amount of way transferred from the sender to the recipient, because transactions can be between two people, can be between contracts, you can send value, right? You have VRS. Uh, these are basically used to generate the signature that identifies the sender of the transaction. Uh, don't worry about that too much. Uh, we have a NIT, uh, which only exists for creating contract uh, creating transactions. Uh, all it does, this is like an EVM code fragment that is used to create the new contract account. And you have data, and this is only used for <coughs> message calls. 
It's used for input data for like function calls that you send between contracts. OK. Message calls and contract creating transactions, they're always initiated by externally owned accounts. You can think of transactions as bridging the external world to the internal state of Ethereum. So you can probably do some interesting techniques in order to build a higher level app if you wanted to. Um, a lot of this course will be about developing dApps, so we'll get into that in the next few lectures. Also, uh, contracts that exist within the global scope of Ethereum, uh, they can talk to other contracts using messages. Another way to think of messages are internal transactions. Um, they're simply just transactions that exist only in the Ethereum execution environment. They're like these virtual objects that you don't really see. Um, however, you can still go see them on like a block explorer if you decide to look. Uh, but they're solely between contracts. Right? Think function calls, think sending data between two autonomous agents. So here's an important thing that I think will clarify some stuff. Uh, so this is an example of nested message calls. Uh, suppose I have uh, you know, two externally owned accounts. Let's start with the top one. Uh, this one sends a transaction to a contract account. That code gets executed. And that ends up sending some data to another contract account, which has some contract code. We have another externally owned account, which sends a transaction uh, to that account as well. And you can see, you can just keep on passing information on and on and on until you know, you're done passing information. Uh, so what are some important things to note about this? Uh, messages do not contain any gas limit. Um, somebody brought up a question earlier wondering, is there a gas limit between messages? No, there's not. Uh, the only gas limit that you think about is from the uh, parent transaction that's always going to be sent from an externally owned account. So remember, if you ever draw one of these graphs, uh, the starting transaction has to be some kind of externally owned account, which then ends up pinging another internal, uh, sorry, ends up pinging an, another contract account through an internal transaction if it ever does. But without the externally owned account, you can't start any of this. So why is this like an issue with the gas limit not being in the message? Basically, you need to like plan out your execution ahead of time. Uh, you need to set a gas limit that's high enough such that the uh, externally owned account uh, that first sends it out and then the nested accounts uh, can handle all kinds of the computation you're expecting it to handle. And if it doesn't, um, you know, the current and the subsequent uh, executions, they are going to revert. However, the parent executions uh, will not revert. So there could be like some dangerous circumstances. You could probably lose money if you ran out of gas in these examples. Uh, a lot of times you'll see people transferring value between contracts. Uh, there's been like multi-sig wallets that do this. Uh, stuff we'll talk about in the future. The last portion of this I want to talk about is smart contracts. <coughs> what is a smart contract? How many of you guys have heard of these? How many of you guys have written a very basic program in these? OK. Uh, smart contracts are pretty simple. They're actually not that smart. They're pretty, they're pretty dumb. Like, you can only do so much with them. Uh, and like I said earlier, you can't do like machine learning or any of that really smart stuff with it. You have to stick to very basic uh, like math functions or cryptographic functions. Cryptography is pretty powerful, though, so I'm not dissing on it. Uh, that said, you know, network consensus uh, with smart contracts removes the need for any trusted third party. So in order to like mess with this code on the network, you need to subvert the entire network. Meaning that if you're a miner, for example, um, suppose you're, there's a bunch of miners on the network, and they're all verifying transactions normally. Uh, you decide you want to subvert the network. What do you do? You need to take at least 51% of the hashing power, um, aka the mining power, in the network 
in order to take control of what the end result is. <coughs> and if you do that, then you can basically change what happens in the state of the network. Now, that's like one of the attacks that you can do. There's many others. Um, but there's also ways that Ethereum tries to prevent this. And we'll mention more of those in the protocol chapter. But all these techniques, um, you know, they only do so much. So this is actually still very possible. A smart contract also allows for peer-to-peer -peer agreements that live on the blockchain pretty much forever. Uh, you know, this thing doesn't like go away because people are running the nodes. Uh, tons of people have copies of the storage. Uh, even people who don't mine on Ethereum, people who run full nodes, for example, that download the entire blockchain, uh, they have the whole copy. So this stuff like pretty much never disappears, just like Google. So you should think of contracts on Ethereum as autonomous agents that live in the network. You shouldn't really think of them as legally binding or things that you have to comply with. That's not what they are. They're, they're just things that you poke, uh, and they react to any external, uh, I guess, stimuli, which are basically the uh, transactions we talked about from the externally owned accounts. So these have direct control over internal Ether balance for that contract account, uh, internal contract state, which is also stored in the contract account, and permanent storage. So there's four purposes, four main ones, for Ethereum smart contracts. Um, the way I like to think of these is kind of like a serverless execution protocol. Um, because you, know, you don't need servers to start running your computation. You just use Ethereum. You just point, you, just, you can write a front end, and then you have that front end point to all the uh, smart contract functions that are on Ethereum. And then you start to call those uh, via your externally owned account, right? So this will lead to the idea that we'll cover in the next few lectures, which are dApps. Um, and these are going to be like the full stack prototypes that we'll strive to be building out. And also the full stack prototypes that the whole industry still has yet to build out. So these are very early stage, not quite ready in terms of user experience. But when they are ready, they'll be a pretty big deal. But well, let's talk about the purposes of these contracts, right? So these contracts, they store and maintain data. They represent something useful to users or other contracts. Maybe it's like a decentralized application that somebody built, and you're storing their balance. Or somebody built a token, and you need to store their balance. Um, this is information that can be very meaningful to people. People could have millions and millions of dollars stored in these contracts. Even a multi-signature wallet, for example, which is um, very commonly used by people to secure their ether, stored in smart contracts. You can also manage contracts or relationships between untrusting users. So this includes applications like escrow, insurance, financial contracts. You can also provide functions to other contracts. You can serve it as a software library. And this is what a lot of people do. You can point to an address on, on chain that's been deployed and you can import that library. And the good thing about this is that uh, if somebody wrote very secure and audited code, it's going to work as fine as it is for as long as Ethereum is uh, not modifying too many things and they wrote secure code. right? So robust software libraries. Complex authentication. Uh, so an example of this is M of N multi-signature access. You might want to set up a complicated scheme where people can uh, distribute keys to other people, and you need multiple keys in order to unlock this wallet, right? Um, maybe, maybe I agreed with someone that, oh, if I die, you have a key that you can that you have personally to unlock this wallet, but you can also call someone else up to unlock this wallet. But you only call them if, if you know, if I'm dead, if my key is no longer there. Uh, so you can program interesting stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, you can delete contracts. Uh, there's a there's like a function to do that. We'll go over that in the next few labs. Yeah. Is there any sort of documentation available, or are the projects to do so to say compile the contracts that can serve as software libraries to like the Ethereum developers? 
Um, I don't quite. Understand. Could you repeat your question? Like, uh, how do we know what uh, contracts we can access to use as software as maybe ah, developers? Yeah. So people will often post these on GitHub, and these <laughs> libraries don't tend to be too complex, to be honest. They're sometimes as simple as being able to concatenate strings, because string concatenation is pretty tricky in Solidity. Um, we'll show we'll show you an example in the next few labs, but you'll have a good laugh when you see it. <laughs> yeah. There probably is. Yeah, I haven't personally looked into it, but whenever I whenever I look for some functionality that I need, I'll usually look on GitHub, and there'll be there'll be something for it, especially if it's a very commonly used thing. Maybe like a maybe if you want like a linked list in Solidity or some other data structure you want to make use of, which probably is pretty expensive to like run. Uh, you can like look for those on GitHub, and people have written libraries for those. Um, Check out Open Zeppelin, and also there's like a bunch of wacky things, like somebody wrote a map reduce implementation. Yeah, Open Zeppelin is also pretty good. They wrote like a security framework. They write a bunch of, they basically wrote a bunch of very secure smart contracts that people most commonly use. So like the basic ERC-20, like a crowd sale contract. Um, they also have a string concatenation one, I remember. But yeah, they have they have a whole library just ready to be used. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. So let's talk a bit about some applications. Um, there's token systems, right? You guys have seen a lot of the new tokens that have been built on top of Ethereum that are now coming out. Um, they're not quite in working stage in terms of the complexity they promised. For example, uh, there's uh, people promising token systems that can uh, reform the ad industry by paying out to different people, but they haven't quite imp they haven't quite deployed anything for that yet. And there's a lot of things that have yet to be deployed. Uh, there's financial derivatives and stable value currencies. Uh, so ex for example, Tether. Um, that's not built on Ethereum, but you could certainly build something like that on Ethereum, uh, where it basically just links to the US dollar. And you just trust some person to make sure that the value of this token is, is backed by one US dollar. Um, now, this obviously gets rid of a lot of the principles of trust that you get with uh, sorry, the principles of trustlessness you get from Ethereum. And that's kind of a trade-off you have to think about, but you can you get some benefits such as being able to select very, very small denominations of a dollar you could never do before, right? Uh, as you saw with Ethereum, you can go you can go as low as one to the negative eighteenth ETH per denomination. That's one way. Whereas like a dollar the lowest denomination you have is like a cent, right? Suppose I had like some kind of token that was a derivative of the dollar. Every single token uh, was backed by a single dollar. Uh, I could basically start sending split dollars to people uh, if I wanted to. I could send like very, very tiny micropayments. Now, transaction fees are a thing, so maybe micropayments isn't the best use case. Um, that That has been like the biggest downfall for micropayments. There's also identity and reputation systems. We talked about Namecoin, right? Uh, that's on Bitcoin. The, e the Ethereum network has something called ENS, uh, very similar. Uh, basically, people, uh, people basically bid on uh, auctions for these domain names. And the auction basically starts once there's like an initial bid for this. And after a certain period of time happens, uh, <coughs> That person gets the domain name if they had the highest bid for that domain name. Otherwise, if somebody outbid them, then they get that they get that domain name. But the auction only starts when somebody starts an initial bid. So it's not like all domain names are for sale yet. Somebody has to like initiate it. So I have to go look at, look for Berkeley.eth. I have to go put in I have to go put in some ether, and then I have to wait. Hopefully, I get it. Somebody's probably going to outbid me because I don't have that much ETH. And then, yeah, I'm not going to get the domain. That's probably what's going to happen. There's also decentralized file storage. Um, this is not commonly done on Ethereum, but it is possible to do. 
However, you, sh you probably shouldn't uh, because it's quite expensive. Decentralized autonomous organizations. How many of you have heard of the DAO? OK. Um, we all heard about this. You know, there was like an attack on the DAO. Um, very hard to write like a secure contract because you know, this, this thing has to be able to give membership to certain people to like vote on things. And it also has to be able to take away membership. Um, yeah, but it also has to hold a lot of money. Uh, so it's pretty tricky to have all these things work out and make sure that uh, people's vote votes are weighted in a fair manner. Uh, yeah, so DAOs are, DAOs are hard to write. Uh, we, may, we may look into writing one during this course. A savings wallet, very basic use case. Um, you can have something that basically allows you to only withdraw 1% uh, because you programmed it that way. You can also have it such that you shared it with another person, that person can draw 1% of your ETH wallet. Um, but if that other person decides to go malicious, you could also have it such that uh, you can take away their access if you're the primary owner. So you can program all these like interesting dynamics that you probably wouldn't be able to secure as well if uh, if you were to use like a traditional bank. Decentralized data feeds, multi, multi signature escrow, um, peer to peer gambling. There's a lot of games on Ethereum that have to do with this, more so implicitly than explicitly. Um, Virtue Poker is probably one of the biggest uh, ones. Basically, it's very it's very easy to uh, have get your source of randomness from the blockchain because the blockchain is actually pretty pretty pseudo random. Uh, that's not really random because you know computers aren't capable of giving out completely random output, but uh, it's deterministically pseudo random. Uh, and by having deterministically pseudo randomness, you can basically create games that allow people to gamble on a peer to peer basis. Uh, because it's, you know, you, people can do code audits of your smart contract and see that, oh, this person is grabbing data from the blockchain as a source of randomness. Uh, now, you could think, you could maybe think of ways to like uh, potentially alter uh, these uh, these games if you were a miner and if you wanted to like change like, for example, the order of transactions. If that was a dependency, um, if that was a dependency for like the casino, then like you could. You could mess with it, um, but it's still a very tricky problem to solve. It's a hard attack vector to hit. There's also prediction markets. Um, maybe some of you have heard of Augur and Gnosis. Um, they kind of work, but basically, like people will vote on what they think is uh, the right answer for typically some stupid question uh, it'll be like who who's going to win the super bowl like who's going to who's going to like is is spacex going to launch like their giant rocket is it going to be successful right you, people will bet on that yes or no and uh, this is like another way to do peer to peer gambling but if for the people who say yes uh, and if they're correct they get paid out people say no their bets go to the yes people it's pretty simple uh, but the cool thing is, by doing this programmatically, um, you can ensure there's complete honesty, and you can also use it as some kind of a data feed. Can anybody think of how you could use a prediction market as some kind of a data feed? As somewhat of a deterministic data feed, maybe that, maybe that gives you a little more of a hint. Okay. Um, the way you could use this as some kind of deterministic data feed is you basically have humans vote on what's like the right answer. And you can just think of it as fetching API calls for you. You can also have machines do the prediction market uh, work for you. Um, so you could have machines vote on certain things. And they could feed that data to you. And you could use that data within your smart contract to make some kind of autonomous execution. So there's ways to kind of link these together in not so obvious ways, but ways that actually would work. Yeah. So we're going to discuss this stuff later. There's a lot of stuff that I didn't quite cover about Ethereum, 
but basically the Ethereum block structure, right? We talked about Bitcoin's block structure a bit in the last lecture. We didn't quite cover that. We're going to talk about how logs are a big part of Ethereum's block structure, omners and uncles. Uh, this gives people uh, incentives to like mine blocks despite them being found. That's the security and speed. Ghost inspector protocols, uh, those are part of kind of how uncles work. Uh, Merkle Patricia tries. Unlike Merkle Patricia trees, these are a little more difficult to understand because one, you have to understand that you're Merkleizing the data from the bottom up, but you're also doing it in a try format and you're doing it for account states. So there's a lot more variables you have to consider. Block difficulty. Um, the ETH hash algorithm is very different than the SHA-256 Bitcoin algorithm, so we will talk about that in the protocol segment. Uh, Ethereum execution model via the EVM. Uh, so this is pretty important to know um, how the stack EVM kind of works and how, it, how uh, all the clients on the Ethereum network decide to execute code and verify it. Formal state transitions to final block. We kind of had we kind of had um, we kind of had some uh, state transition functions on Bitcoin that were that were interesting. Uh, there'll be like more pseudocode that we dive into on like how Ethereum decides to finalize blocks because again with an account-based system and having to compute a lot more uh, complex programs, you need to have more complex functionality within the state transitions. And we're also going to talk about Ethereum's proof of work because verifying the blocks uh, is different since Bitcoin's purpose is just you know to verify transactions as money transfers, but this is all about verifying state as well. So there's a whole different proof of work process. So yeah, uh, that's all I have for you guys.